Have you ever looked at some of the specs of a mic or an interface and you just didn't get it? Or maybe you've been watching my videos and there are just one or two of those numbers that just seem to go over your head. That's okay. Trust me. But if you've been curious, well, let's see what we can do. Before we get into anything, massive thanks to Dylan Lalonde, who was a major part in making this video come together. He was my fact checker and honestly saved me from making an arse out of myself almost on a daily basis. Okay, let's start this out with one of the most talked about sample rate. You may have seen it listed as 44.1 or 44,100. And generally speaking, you may see this number go as high as 192 or even higher and it's measured in kilohertz. Now, sample rate is a concept given to a digital signal. When I speak into this microphone, the interface in the computer takes samples of the microphone's electrical output that's caused from my voice several times per second. So at 44.1 kilohertz or 44,100 hertz, there are 44,100 samples of my voice taken every second. These samples are taken at the point where the audio sound is converted into a digital signal. And in very simple terms, this means the higher the sample rate, the more accurately audio waveforms can be recreated in the digital realm. Now, there is a lot more information on this. Some of it can be rather confusing, but I will leave you with this. Audiophile music is recorded at a much higher sample rate, usually 96 kilohertz, and generally reduced when needed to 48 kilohertz. Most musical recordings will record at 48 kilohertz, though some like the added harmonic bandwidth of 96 kilohertz or greater. If you're recording audio for video, 48 kilohertz is the standard, though most video editing software can upsample it, though that should be only used as a last resort. Record and work with as much content in 48 kilohertz as possible if you're doing video. And there's a reason for that. If you've ever noticed over longer videos where the audio becomes out of sync, that's because it's not 48 kilohertz. But for spoken word, like podcasts, 44.1 should do just fine. Now, this needs to be explained before we move on to bit depth. Dynamic range is basically the range between the quietest and the loudest sounds that you can record. This may also be described as signal to noise ratio or SNR. Once again, the lowest to highest sounds measured in decibels. This one goes hand in hand with sample rate and is, as the name says, measured in bits. You may have seen 16, 24, or even 32 bit floating point. Now what you need to know is, this is referring to the volume or amplitude resolution of what you can record. Also, the number associated with the bit depth is the amount of information that is in each individual sample that is taken. So basically, the higher the bit depth, the more information in each sample and the more accurate the digital recording will be. So then, to go back to my earlier statement about dynamic range, each bit represents about 6 dB of dynamic range, meaning with 16 bit, your recording will have 96 dB of dynamic range. But as you go higher, exponential math kicks in. As you double your bit depth, your signal to noise ratio is also doubled and the amount of different volume levels each sample can have doubles with each bit that you add to the bit depth. This is where you start going in over your head. Now, this is with respect to fixed point sample rates. Floating point is a bit different, but that's way beyond the scope of this video. And frankly, some of what I just said is beyond the scope of this video. But to give you an idea of the exponential math, a 24-bit will have 144 dB of dynamic range. 32-bit floating is 1528 dB of dynamic range. Being able to choose higher bit rates is never a bad thing. So if you have the option, choose 24-bit for some extra volume resolution. Let's move on with frequency response. This usually comes with a graph something like this. What this is telling you is how the different frequencies are reproduced and for microphones, this is very important. The flatter the line means there is no deviation or change to the original sound. But as the frequencies jump and dip, you will hear how they impact the final product. Now, you can get an idea of how that works if you play with an EQ. You're going to notice in the middle of this graph is 0 dB. And it goes above and below to show whether a frequency is higher or lower. 
So looking at the SM58 frequency response, you'll notice it boosts up between two and 3000 Hertz. And at 5000 Hertz, it levels out at five dB, meaning the sounds in the range of frequency will be five dB louder. On the other hand, from about 40 Hertz to 120 Hertz, you're gonna notice the frequency is less strong, dipping down past negative 10 dB at the lowest, meaning it will not pick up those frequencies as well. In case your head is still swimming, Think of it like a preloaded EQ profile on the mic. If you are still struggling with this though, maybe take a round at an EQ to see kind of how it impacts the different frequencies. There is something to note though. The human ear can only hear between 20 Hertz and 20 kilohertz. And that upper end does go down steadily with age. Some think we can perceive as high as 50 kilohertz though not with our ears, but through bone conduction, which doesn't sound fun at all. This one is one of the more important specs on a microphone, but as per usual, it doesn't tell the whole story. That said, self noise is the noise that a microphone makes on its own without any extra input. Now, this is generally attributed to a condenser microphones, but even some dynamics have a self noise in their stat sheet. Basically, this is all the noise that is present due to the circuitry inside the microphone. For example, even a simple resistor offers up its own noise in the signal path. While it may seem minute, and it is, once you get the whole package together, all that circuitry will have some sort of noise level, and it might actually be audible. There's no way around it. The noise level is rarely anything of consequence though, unless the microphone is particularly cheap. The only time it can really become a problem is when you're using compression, which can amplify the noise. Generally speaking though, anything under 11 dB is considered extremely quiet. And frankly, anything under 19 dB is perfectly fine. The issues tend to start somewhere around 20 dB. Okay, this is a tough one for a lot of people. It trips a lot of people up. Now, you remember dynamic range, the difference between the softest and the loudest sounds. Well, a compressor looks to level that out, making the track have less dynamic range by limiting the loudest sounds and by amplifying the softest. It's called a compressor because it compresses the dynamic range in varying degrees for what ends up sounding like a more consistent audio experience if done properly. Some compressors also impart a signature sound or coloration to the audio and are used as an effect as opposed to just a simple level management. With all that said, compression, whew, it can be tough to master. And if you're too heavy handed, you're gonna crush the audio beyond all recognition, like you're gonna do to that like button, just destroy it, sorry. And yes, there's a reason you don't want to get too compression happy. You see, our brains are wired to appreciate dynamic range, the soft subtleties of a voice or a plucked string. With that said though, the brain does not like scenarios where a softly plucked string is as flat and as loud as a jet engine. So while you're looking for a fuller sound, make sure you're not overdoing it or the audio will just end up sounding harsh. Now, if you want to start to play with compression, here are the terms you need to become familiar with. Now we're going to be talking about variable threshold compressors specifically, as opposed to fixed threshold compressors, the threshold, as we're saying, is the point that the compressor engages and starts to turn the gain down. So this would be the max dB level before it kicks in. That will work hand in hand with the attack time. That is the speed at which the gain gets turned down. So a fast attack time will grab a rampant signal right away, whereas a slower attack time will let more of an initial transient through, retaining some of that signal's initial loudness or abruptness. The release time, on the other hand, is the opposite of attack time. How long will it take for the compression to ease off as things become quiet again? And the compression ratio is the level of compression that is applied and based on the name, yes, it's a ratio form. The ratio is for every so many dB coming in above the threshold, the compressor will allow one dB out. For example, a one to one ratio will not compress the signal at all. One dB in above the threshold to one dB out. A two to one ratio will have the signal if it crosses the threshold, meaning if the signal goes to four dB over the threshold, it will reduce it by two dB. If it crosses by six dB, the output level will be three dB lower than that. Now, a three to one ratio is considered moderate. 
Five to one ratio is medium and eight to one ratio is considered strong. 20 to one or greater is getting into limiter territory. And finally, out of all of this, you have output gain or makeup gain. This is the amount that the signal is amplified on the way out. So this is the part that makes the quieter part seem louder. So if you're setting the threshold at five dB, you may want to set the output gain to five dB. So do you have all that? Give it a shot and play with it. But remember, always have another copy of the audio before you commit to any processing. Trust me on this. As soon as you commit to that processing, as Dylan likes to say, you can't uncook bacon. So very true when you're messing around with audio. That's it for this one. What did you think? Did any of it soak in? I'm kind of curious. Let me know down in the comments if there's anything else you want explained as well. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, as I said, crush it. If you really liked the video, maybe try out that subscribe button. Come along for the ride. It's been a fun one so far. Cheers, and I'll see you in the next video.